so here in Psalm 117, it says, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, Laud him, all you people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. Hasn't God's merciful kindness been good to Calvary Eldoret? What we have experienced these years and these months of Bible teaching is so incredible. I mean, he is sending Bible teachers from around the world to encourage us. Just a little old place called Eldoret, Kenya, where nobody would ever give the time or day except God remembered his people here. We thank God for this. So, enough of that. Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. We'll pick up where we left off, as is our custom. We left off in verse 19, and as we move on, let's pray. Lord, we we thank you for your mercy endures forever. We sing praise to you. What you've done, Lord, no man can take credit for. You set your people amongst savage wolves, and you give us the tools to be victorious. And you've set your church in the middle of a city that is corrupt, filled with sexual immorality, filled with hatred, and you've brought the people who are corrupt and immoral and hateful, and you've forgiven us, and you set us free from those sins. I pray, Lord, that you would receive the reward of your suffering. And that you would continue to do your work amongst us and in this city. Bringing more people into the body of Christ. Adding to the church, not yearly, but daily. As your word says, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in verse 20, it says, The poor man is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich has many friends. This isn't saying that the poor man should be hated for his poverty, but rather it is going to begin a truth that is rather unfortunate in our society, not just in this society, but every society that has ever had poor people, which is every society that has ever had humanity. And rather than saying, oh, poor people should be hated, which, by the way, if you think that is unnecessary for me to say, this is a verse that has been spoken many times here in this nation as a verse that would indicate that poor people should be hated for their poverty. Isn't that terrible? In fact... It is a verse that has been said to such a degree because, uh, by the Word of Faith movement, a, uh, doctrine, a den of thieves, doctrine of demons, a ministry that made me so upset and frustrated and burdened, not because I hate, but because I love. That on one particular occasion, somebody sent me a video where um, that false teacher said uh, that poor people have no wisdom. And if you want to have wisdom, you should get out of your poverty and poor people are hated. And because the word of faith movement, they use this verse. Isn't that terrible? And you know what? It's interesting. A little secret that these people should know, and by the way, a little secret that you should know is that Bill Gates is poor. Warren Buffett is poor. The richest man in Kenya is poor. I mean, what kind of poverty are we comparing, or excuse me, what kind of riches are we comparing uh, ourselves to? Because when it comes to the riches of Christ, we are all poor. (laughs) Talk about poverty. It's interesting, and it's analogous in the next few proverbs concerning the poor it's analogous of how God feels about the poor and guess who's poor all of us 
So when it says, unfortunately, giving um, a, a proverb of the, not the condition of the poor as much as the condition of sinful men who regard the poor as people who should be hated. It's a terrible um, caricature. It's a terrible viewpoint. And so it's just the reality. Solomon is stating a reality of our world that exists in the hearts of sinful men and sinful women that unfortunately poor people are hated. It's not saying it should be this way. It should not be this way. And that's why, you know, in contrast to that, rich people have many friends. Isn't this unfortunate? We should neither be biased towards the poor nor towards the rich when it comes to treating people with dignity and kindness. We shouldn't be mean to the rich because we're poor. And we shouldn't be mean to the poor because we're rich. Understanding a foundational principle of humanity, and that is all humanity is poor. You know what is uh, real riches? A word fitly spoken in due season is like um, uh, uh, um, bowls of silver containing apples of gold. Isn't that an amazing proverb? (laughs) A word uh, fitly spoken in due season is bowls of silver with apples of gold in it. Can you imagine having a solid thing of gold that was the size of an apple? That would be worth, by the way, around 20 million shillings. And and, and you just, you said, so that is more valuable, 20, and it says apples of gold, so there can be 20 apples in the bowl of silver. The silver bowl is probably worth a million. The apples in in the bowl could be worth 100 million. And a word of wisdom, fitly spoken, is more precious than um, than all the money. It's it's more precious than silver. It's more precious than gold. So what should we attain to more? Well, the kingdom of God first. Of course, we should work. We need to earn um, monetary gain for supplying. Uh, food and raiment for our families, but that is not our primary goal in life. Our primary goal in life, what is the chief thing? It is wisdom. And the proper um, application of wisdom is under, uh, so, so is understanding. Understanding is, and knowledge and, uh, is nothing without um, wisdom. Wisdom is the chief thing amongst the three. Because you can have the knowledge and not have the wisdom to apply it. You can have the understanding on not how to apply it, but don't, uh, to apply it, but not have the wisdom to apply it. Wisdom is the chief thing. Wisdom. So we got to be careful, and it does warn us in verse 21, but he who despises his neighbor sins, but he who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. So this is the condition of a fallen world. Poor people are hated, rich people are loved. Well, that's wickedness. The, the senior pastor of the first church in Jerusalem, um, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, James, now becomes the full brother of Jesus Christ because he's saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, um, would, would say when you see a poor person come into the room and you say, sit down at my feet and then a rich person comes in the room, you say, here, have the highest uh, um, seats in the assembly, have the padded chair, the throne. Have we not become like who? Like Satan. Judges of evil thoughts. Our thoughts are evil. We exalt what the world says is power and we bring low what the world says is pathetic and weak. Don't you thank God that he's not that way? Me and uh, Peter were in a, a lunch with a, a particular gentleman 
who was a pastor for 28 years at a church in this nation. And though the church had seasons of fruitfulness, he um, confided in us and, and said that now the elders run the church. The pastors have no say in the outreach or direction or the vision. And the people who become the elders are the prominent men in society and their prominence is determined by how much money they make. And he had to leave. Pastor for, or a member 28 years, a pastor for like 20 of those years. And he's with us now. And listen, we got to be careful because we can fall under the traps like we're better than everyone. No, that church used to be great. And if we're not careful, we'll become just like them. Just like them, where we start exalting the worldly rich and we start bringing low the worldly poor. And if you ask me, I would take somebody who doesn't have money if they have wisdom over somebody who has money but doesn't have wisdom any day of the week. Any day of the week because God does not operate under the financial gain of the world. He operates under the power of the Holy Spirit for those who have wisdom and the knowledge of Christ and the understanding to apply that wisdom. So we don't treat people like this. He who despises his neighbor sins. I remember... Um, a, a good pastor, he had a good heart, he loved the Lord, he um, loved the word, and we were starting our churches, uh, you know, around the same time many years ago, he was a Kenyan man, he started a church in Pioneer. I love this man, he was a sweet man, and um, when he got his little Mombati there, um, and tried to build a little structure. It was still dirt floors there in Pioneer. And he started inviting his neighbors, the neighbors around that church. And one of the ladies said to him, why would I go to your church? You still have dirt floors at your church. And don't people think this way? Make no mistake about it, the power of Calvary Chapel Eldoret is not its lights, its speakers, its nice wooden walls. It is the power of God's word. And if you don't jump into that boat of power and you're just impressed with the stuff that we have, you're not going to come along for the ride, the ride of seeing what God is doing in the hearts and minds of so many people. Don't despise your neighbor because they're poor. That makes us sinful. But he who has mercy on the poor, it, it, notice it doesn't say here, will be blessed. Now, you will be blessed, but it says that happy is he. That in God's infinite wisdom and in all the different ways we can become happy through spiritual means, sustained happiness, eternal happiness, that one of those ways is proper treatment towards the poor. That we become happy when we are kind and merciful and generous to those who are in need. So, we ought to treat people, pastor, Poor, prophet, well, prophets are hard to treat well in this country for me, but I'm trying. Rich, poor, we treat them all with kindness. I want you to know something that I hope you have already figured out about me. I preach against wolves, false prophets, false teachers, heretics, I preach against them. I have for many, many years. But if one came in the room, I would treat them with respect and kindness. And if they needed something, I would do everything within my ability to give it to them. 
as long as I didn't have to comp- compromise my faith in doing so. When I preach against these things, I hope you are not being incited with anger, but with knowledge about what God's word truly is. Because one of the greatest signs of true, authentic Christianity and a love for Christ is not how we treat those whom we love, but how we treat those who are our enemies. And this is what sets us apart from just the angry people who may mask themselves with true Christianity. If one of the Pharisees would have fallen on their knees and asked for forgiveness, you better believe that Jesus Christ would have forgiven them. And he so did with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who were religious leaders in the temple at the time, who became born again. So, moving on. Verse 22, do they not go astray who devise evil? But mercy and truth belong to those who devise good. You know, I was sitting there thinking when we were singing, uh, Lord, I need you, and I pour out my heart, uh, two of some of my favorite songs in worship. Um, You know, and I I was thankful to the Lord because I, I was so touched by the songs. I was so touched by the Lord's goodness for my life and your lives and our church's lives. And there are, there are times, unfortunately, where my heart is a little more harder than soft. And we can, listen, we can go astray when we're not walking with God day by day. And one of the tests you can put yourself through is that as you, there, see, what happens is people get excited when they first get saved, People will get excited when they first come to Calvary Chapel Elder. It's like, oh, this place is awesome. I found a place where they're not coercing or manipulating or lying. And I'm born again. And they love the preaching. And they love the songs. And they love the fellowship and the freedom. And, and that's for a few months and maybe a year or two. And then... Uh, it's another Thursday night and it's another Sunday morning and it's another Thursday night and it's another Sunday morning and it's another Thursday. You know what I'm going to say next, don't you? Night and another Sunday morning. And then something has to happen. We have to mature as Christians. We have to say, well, Christianity is about much, something much more deep than feelings and emotions. It's about commitment and love and faithfulness. And when you keep on doing the disciplines, because you love, because you know you need to be faithful, and so you are, you can find yourself being overwhelmed even 17 years later by the Holy Spirit to where you can sit in the front row and even cry when the song starts being sung, Lord, I need you. I'm not saying I cried, but I know, no, I I am saying that, I did. I did. A manly cry. It wasn't like, <laughs> it's just tears, just tears. But guys, don't think this is talking about just the unregenerate, the unsaved. This is those who can have that, at least on the outward form, a real excitement of faith, of assembling together as the church. And sometimes it can be years later and they stop. We had a, a woman come on Sunday morning this last week and she says, we stopped going to church. We were in a season of life where um, we weren't doing good. And then our lives were getting worse. Why? Because those who go astray or the mockers, or the scoffers, or those who just aren't obeying God, they'll go astray. And she said, you know how the Lord brought them back? I've never heard this before. It was encouraged me. The Lord brought this family back because they had dreams that Kelsey and I would come and give them gifts and then give them long hugs where we just wrapped our arms around them 
and held them tight. I'm not trying to say I'm like prophet of war where I'm going to end up in all of your dreams. That would be a scary thought, wouldn't it? But this is what the Lord used to bring this family back. Be careful. You can be faithful for five years and then go astray. Mercy and truth belong to those who devise good. Their plans are good plans. And you know what? God has given us the plans that we ought to have. Our plans, we don't forsake the assembling together of believers. We don't forsake proclaiming the name of Christ. We don't forsake being conduits of the truth. We don't forsake manifesting the nature of God in our lives, the fruit of the spirit of joy and kindness and faithfulness and patience and self-control and the foundation of it all is love. We don't forsake those good things. We don't go astray by making bad plans. Oh, I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm done. But we make good plans and mercy is upon those whose plans are the plans of God. Verse 23, in all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. I don't know if this, it became such a funny thing in America that comedians did it. And I don't know if it this kind of culture is in Kenya, but have you ever talked to that person who's always talking about inventing something that's going to make them millions of dollars or shillings? Did you have that in Kenya? No? Well, it became such a thing in America that they made a movie where there was a guy smoking bangi, which I know half of you have done because you're Calvary Chapel people. And, and uh, he, they're smoking bangy in the movie and they're getting high on weed and then they just start talking. And this one guy in the movie's like, I got all these plans, man. I got all these ideas. They're going in my mind like I'm going to invent something and we can make millions and just smoke weed, man. I'm quoting the movie. I, I, I'm cursed. I remember all these things in mo- movies. Word for word. Well, you know, that happens. They're just sitting under trees talking about the day where they become rich. You know, and then they're like, you know what? We can do betting. Betting online. Bet. Isn't bet, isn't this some... But which, by the way, if you don't know, let me clear it up for you. If you're gambling, you're in sin. If you're on your phone, bet. Isn't it BT some, something? Whatever it is. If you're doing that, repent tonight. You're squandering your money trying to get rich quick. Look up the statistics, by the way. Do some research on people who want a lot of money without working for it. As fast as it came in is as fast as it goes out. A penny saved or... I'm in, I'm in Kenya. A shilling saved is a shilling earned. You know what that means, right? You'll save your money. You'll do good with your money. You'll be generous. You'll be righteous with your money if you earned it. If you don't earn it, you'll be unrighteous with it. And going and win the lottery, you guys, have you, have you seen these reality TV shows where people follow up people who won the lottery? They have no money. They went and spent it all. Uh, Another example of this is professional sports players who never grew in wisdom, but because they had talent, they made millions. As soon as they're done in the NBA or in football, you know, football leagues, or as soon as they're done with uh, baseball, they're broke again. There's been entire reality TV shows on people who aren't righteous with their money. And, a lot, and, and what the Bible's saying here is you're unrighteous when you're just talking about becoming rich and trying to find ways to become rich that involve no labor. It's like the people just smoking bangy. We're going to make our millions, bro. No, you're not. 
You're going to smoke it. Even if you get a million, you're going to smoke it in a week. It's going to be gone. And you're going to go show how many ladies, how much money you got. And they're going to take it because they know how to take it. I'm kidding. Sorry, ladies. That was a joke. I mean, it wasn't, but I'm going to say it was a joke so you don't hate me. Verse 24, the crown of the wise is their riches. But the foolishness or fools, uh, they're, oh, excuse me, the foolish of fools is folly. Guys, do you see a pattern? It's over and over. It's, as, it, it's ad nauseum. I'm nauseous on how many times the Proverbs have to repeat themselves. Do you smell that? Somebody is smoking bangi right now. I'm, I'm kidding. Trash burning smells like weed to me. If you're a visitor, the reason I always make these references is because I smoked bangi for 10 years of my life. So I joke about it. I do not think that anybody should be doing it. It will destroy your minds. But every now and again, when it smells like this, you just gotta count your blessings, name them one by one. I'm sorry, that's another joke. Um, Once again, (laughs) once again, It says that wisdom is a crown of riches. I hope that this isn't just theoretical knowledge to you. Have you guys hung around really rich people who are ungodly? And they start drinking? And they start talking? And they're foul and curses come out of their mouth? you, You guys have been around these people, haven't you? You know what? I pity them. Those people that I wanted to be like before I got saved... I feel sorry for them now. I actually feel sorry for them. By the way, I don't know why. God has put me into different positions where I'm around a lot of these business owners in this town. People who are worth millions. They own five buildings. And and they start drinking. You know, because just so you know, I'm not at clubs or anything. I go play golf sometimes. I, I, I like sports. And so I'm around these guys sometimes at the Eldoret Club. Now, I'm mostly by myself, like some weirdo there that doesn't have any friends, just so you know. But sometimes they're like inviting me to come talk to them. I'm like, sure. So I share the gospel with them and they start cussing. They start looking dumb when they drink. In other words, their riches make them look foolish. And, they, and, and this isn't a joking matter. They go, they go and they start hitting on each other's wives. And you know it's a meat market of fornication and adultery. You actually think for a second that I want to be these men? No! I don't! Feel sorry for them. Wisdom is a crown of riches. And then, guys, we get to be around those people who have wisdom, don't we? Man, isn't it much better? We've we've experienced it, right? Haven't we experienced the influx of wisdom in this last month? And we, We get to sit and we get to hang out with people who have wisdom and we're asking them questions and they're giving the right answers. Oh, that's a joy. That's riches. That's going to preserve your life. That's going to bless your life. That's going to bring joy to your life. Verse 25, a true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaks lies. We have to stop being a man pleaser. We have to be those people that speak truth with courage. We have to have courage to speak truth in every situation we find ourselves in. Let's not be man pleasers. When we are around people and all this lies and foolishness going around, we speak it in love, but we still speak it. We speak truth, we win a soul. It's better to win a soul than win a friend right away because you're kissing, well, that's another American idiom, because you're being a man pleaser. I almost said because you're kissing their butt. That's not right. Don't do that. 
A true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaks lies. Guys, gossip and slander hurts people. It hurts people. It divides friends. It destroys friendships. It destroys people's minds. We have to stop gossiping and slandering. We have to treat it as one of those sins that is as wicked as murder. By the way, I was so blessed when David Guzik came and when we were doing the Q&A and somebody asked the question about the Trinity, I was so blessed that he noticed the Trinity was on our walls. And then I asked if you guys noticed and you, you didn't raise your hand. But you know what I think happens is some of you should raise your hand because that applies to you, but um, you don't because you don't want to be embarrassed by raising your hand. So I, I think some of you noticed, right? No, no one really noticed, huh? Well, that was an intention. We have the Trinity. We have the greatest distinctive that any church should ever have, and that's exposition. And the reason I put this one is because there is so much gossip and slander in the church. That's why I put that one in case you wanted to know. Tearing people apart. Love with hypocrisy. Pretending you love. Pretending we love by talking bad about people behind their back. No, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Because a deceitful witness speaks lies. He hurts people. He gossips. He slanders. Verse 26, in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn away one from the snares of death. This is an interesting thing. Something I studied many years ago, I wanted to understand what it meant by fearing God. Because we in our modern times and many times across human history believe that fear is bad always and really it's not. There are very important fears like the fear of not wanting to walk in front of a matatu going 80 kilometers down the road because you're going to die. That's a good fear. We'll also fearing the Lord but that still doesn't explain what the fear of the Lord is. And when I studied it, I was so blessed. So if you don't know this, though I've said it a thousand times, maybe you're new. The fear of the Lord is to acknowledge the presence of God. That is the fear of the Lord. So there is a truth and the reality that we live in, though our eyes see very little, there is an entire world that our eyes do not see. One of the greatest truths about God is that he is omnipresent. He is in this room right now. We know through the teachings of uh, the Old and New Testament that for those of us who are born again, the Holy Spirit is inside of us, which means the nature of the Father and Christ uh, is in us as well. But we also know through the truth of Scripture that he's here. He inhabits this atmosphere and when we believe by faith that, that is true we'll have fear because we know he's here I didn't mean to rhyme I think that was the Holy Spirit that was cool though right we have fear because we know he's here write that down isn't that incredible I see, and people are a little bit shocked by my preaching sometimes when I go to the States. You guys aren't shocked, right? You're used to it. But I told Calvary Chapel Philadelphia recently, and I'll tell you, there's probably nobody in this church, they were shocked, by the way, that I would say this from the pulpit, but it seems to make sense to me. There's probably nobody in this church that has watched pornography with their mothers, right? 
Now, there's a lot of wickedness in this room, but I, I doubt anybody in this room has ever done that. Right? Okay. Why? Because of the presence of your mother. You wouldn't do that in front of her. You do that in secret. You do that in the secret places. But guess, guess who's in the secret places? God. And if you really fear him, you're not going to say he's sitting in the chair with you. It's right there. It's like, well, that's going to change things about your life. It's going to change what you watch. It's going to change what you say. It's going to change what you do. So the fear of the Lord is a strong confidence. Now, that contrast is, is incredible because we view people that are fearful as somebody who's insecure and not confident. But if you are fearing the Lord, you will have confidence in front of men. If you can bow before God, you can stand before men. And the greatest influencers, the greatest people amongst us are those who can stand tall before men because they have bowed their knees in the fear of the Lord. Very important. The fear of the Lord is also a fountain of life. Guys, exactly what I'm talking about. The fear of the Lord is to acknowledge his presence. And if you acknowledge his presence, you will walk in righteousness. And if you walk in righteousness, you'll have life. But if you don't fear God, you're going to walk in unrighteousness and there death will come upon you. Sin produces death. The wages of sin is what? Death. And it starts with fearing God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Guys, when you are tempted next, remember the reality and believe it in faith, though you can't see it, that God is standing right there with you. It'll change what you say, it will change what you do, it will change what you watch. In the multitude of people is a king's honor, but in the lack of people is the downfall of a prince. Um, people garnish followings based on um, either uh, righteousness, which gives people the desire to want to follow, but, um, or else people use power, which turns people into worldly slaves. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Patience, self-control um, produces um, um, a, a better reputation than um, being impulsive with anger. Um, it's very important that uh, we're not somebody who can just be controlled by what other people do around us, but our self-control comes from a place that is within us, a place that is ruled by the Holy Spirit. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Guys, jealousy is gonna kill you. It's gonna destroy you. Don't be a jealous person. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. The, the idea of reproach is an interesting word. It's the idea, it, it, you, a synonymous word here is shame. When somebody treats poor people bad, they are shaming God. Because all humanity is created in God's image and because people are poor, they, that's no reason to treat them badly. The wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has a refuge in death. That's a cool proverb. Essentially what Solomon is, is doing is rather than just giving a wise saying, within a wise saying, it is a prophecy concerning what will happen to God's people. God's people will have comfort in death because he 
uh, who is absent from the body will be present with the Lord, but those who die without Christ will be cast out. They'll be separated from the Lord. They'll be banished. Um, it's important that if you're not born again, that you get born again immediately. Wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding. Uh, but what is in the heart of fools is made known. We talked about wisdom and understanding. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If you think for one second righteousness will come to Kenya because we change the government, you are wrong. Righteousness will come to Kenya when God's people start walking in righteousness. I know how much the church has suffered in Kenya. But Kenya has fallen and it is the church's fault, not the president's. Was that too harsh? It's true, so receive it. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him who causes shame. Guys, for employers, for a king, for a president, for a church, for a pastor, we want wise people around us, not foolish. We have to endure foolishness sometimes to disciple people, but um, if you want to be valuable at your workplace, at your families, at your church, in your nation, be a wise person. That is value. Amen? Guys, um, invite people to Thursday night. These Thursday nights are precious. You know, we're just going through the Old Testament. I know some people can't make it because they're working at the hospitals or, uh, you know, doing other things, but there are a number of people who have no good excuse on why they're not coming to receive God's word. Um, invite our church members to Thursday night so that uh, we can go through the Old Testament together. Um, the book of Proverbs is profound. Um, we're gonna come into different books. I know Pastor Odoyo has been teaching in Judges. I've had the privilege of teaching Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. And uh, did I teach Deuteronomy? I don't remember. Um, we'll, we'll teach it if I haven't. And so it's gonna be very beneficial to people if they can come and do what you guys are doing tonight. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom of, of uh, understanding and knowledge and help us to have the wisdom to apply it. I pray you'd bless each person for coming here tonight to receive the portion that you have given them a portion of food that will produce spiritual strength and fruit, we ask. And Lord, we do uh, pray for all the events coming up. We've had so many, but we have more. And I pray your Holy Spirit would pour out to such a degree that we would have revival. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.